Welcome to Real Estate Investing Abundance, the show for busy, fulfilled professionals like you to learn how to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alan Lomax. Hello, enlightened investors. Welcome back to the show. I'm so glad you're with us again today as we take a look at how to go bigger, faster in commercial real estate investment and do it the right way. Keith Meyer is a purposeful commercial real estate operator and investor who has participated in a diverse set of investment vehicles within the industry. His family and network of investors have owned and specifically increased the worth of several large multi manufactured home communities over the past 25 years. Keith leads the deal sourcing and acquisition side of Symphony Capital Group, working directly with brokers and co-sponsors to acquire properties which meet his team's distinct criteria. Keith focuses on the development of win-win partnerships, which are well-defined from inception and highly productive up on implementation. So Keith, take us into the show and share an experience that helped form who you are today. Well, well stated, Alan. I appreciate the great intro there. So yeah, Keith Meyer, uh, principal with Symphony Capital Group. And wow, asking a great question right off the bat. Formative experience. I think I would have to go with one of the first official jobs that I had back because I was uh, early on in high school. I was looking at a couple of different opportunities to kind of get into the workforce and Eventually, ended up doing some some project management, primarily around uh, landscaping on one of our commercial properties, a mobile home park that we purchased in the mid '90s back in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I'm originally from. So you know, you start working for for your family, start having uh, responsibility to to show up on time, to have a pretty large scope of work, uh, somewhat self defined, in, in, in many cases, and then inevitably, as you you know start to have responsibility and and the tenants and residents can see that at a given property, you're approached with management, property management related questions. So I think that really built some character. I started to kind of answer on behalf of our hired property management on some questions as far as how the property was, was being managed and operated. So that really helped to initiate me and cut my teeth in terms of overall property management and then higher level asset management. And I've mm-hmm. been able to expand and roll a lot of those learnings into the uh, portfolio of multifamily properties that we own and operate today. Uh, Keith, you say that if you become an expert in putting capital together, that's both the debt and the equity stack, that you can certainly go a long ways in this business. So how do we go about understanding that critical aspect of real estate investing? Multifaceted process. And just as you illustrated, it's extremely important. So keeping your, your ear to the ground as far as what's going on in the market. Obviously, there's been a lot of turmoil over the last six months or so, and the, the mar- equity markets have shift, shifted. I should say the capital markets specifically on the debt side. So over the last five years or so, it was about as easy as could be to get high quality debt, good interest rates, high loan to value. Uh, and you really didn't have to put a whole lot of thought into that. You could go to any number of lenders, uh, didn't have to be super selective, and you could get a pretty solid loan product. Well, that's certainly shifted here in the last couple months. And really, everything starts uh, from the debt side and is is kind of sequenced past that when you get into equity, then ultimately the capital sources that are needed to bring to the closing table. So being as proactive and developing those relationships with direct bank lenders, mortgage brokers, bridge lenders, agency contacts, Fannie Freddie, if you're able to get even you know partial KP credit on an agency loan proactively, which is something that my family's accomplished, then uh, that really shortcuts and, and helps you expand that in the future as well. And we found that the debt drives the equity to a large extent. So uh, you're going to have trouble raising equity if you have trouble getting the debt. And it's kind of a, a double whammy factor. So really want to avoid putting yourself in that situation and be as proactive on the debt side as you can be in today's market. Uh, Keith, you mentioned that we're in a changing market. Just a few months ago, it was easy getting debt that has changed. What are the big changes and how are you approaching that aspect of debt now as opposed to six months ago? There's a couple different changes as far as terms. So when you're seeing a term sheet, you're going to see what that loan to value looks like. That's generally going to be lower as uh, senior lenders become more risk averse. 
So with that, you're having to bring more equity or equity-like products to the table. So we're seeing some traditional common equity LP types, family offices that would have just written large common equity checks and called it a day six months ago. Now they're starting to get more into the preferred return, preferred equity space, which is a little bit of a specialized product that usually comes at the tap, the top of the waterfall if your investors are familiar with waterfall distributions. And then there's some interlinking that those groups need to do with the senior lender as well. So that's another motivation to be proactive on the debt side is to find a lender who's cooperative with a preferred equity group or even a mezzanine debt group, um, which is kind of a secondary form of debt, similar to preferred equity. But those groups are going to generally require certain management type controls that the lender needs to be comfortable with. And then obviously the sponsor, ourselves as a sponsor, need to be comfortable with as well. And all that stuff takes time to hash out in terms of the turn sheet and then ultimately incorporate into the complex uh, legal documents, operating agreements that we're also fond of. So as as early as you can get on that and get that org chart uh, really mapped out and get everyone on the same page, that'll certainly behoove you to be able to arrive at the closing table on, on time. Keith waterfalls can get complex and there's no really set standard as to what is going to be in the waterfall. But just give us a general idea what a waterfall is and what is the difference between regular equity and preferred equity. Yeah, absolutely. So if you think of the top of the waterfall, uh, typically you're going to have what's called a preferred return. And that can be kind of a separate, larger equity group, like I just mentioned, or that can be a preferred return that goes to the individual LP investors. So those investors are what's technically called common equity, but they can still be given a preferred return as well. So whether you're a preferred equity group getting that return or your common equity uh, LP that's you know, writing a, a standard fifty dollars to $100,000 check, you can also get a preferred return as well that's at the, the top of the waterfall. And so that's just a, a annualized cash payment, usually on the magnitude of anywhere from 5 to 8% uh, annually these days on capital contributed. So that gets paid out first before anything else. Below that, you have your GPLP split. So typically that's on the magnitude of 80% or 70% to the LP investors, and then 20 to 30% to the general partners. So that uh, 70 or 80% to the LPs will be paid out first. So again, the LP payments trump the, uh, the GP payments. So kind of at the bottom of the waterfall is, is where the sponsors are typically located after all the investors have been taken care of. Anything that's left over is distributed to the uh, general partners and operators. So the waterfall is the preferred return, then the limited partners, and then finally the general partners are at the bottom of that stack. So if everything goes as planned generally in most performers, everybody's going to get paid. But if things don't go as intended and the payouts are not what were put in the performa it's going to be going to the preferred and they may take all of the of the payouts there in some of the the waterfalls depending on how they're written but if there's anything left over then it then it goes to the limited partner and then if there's anything left over than that then it goes to the general partner is that correct, correct? Yeah. that is correct you nailed it and so you're saying that the split between the general partner and the limited partners is is anywhere from 80, 20 to 70, 30. Over the last couple of years, it has sometimes even been challenging for general partners to come in with a 20%. Do you see that shifting so that that is becoming more balanced between the 70, 30 as opposed to the 80, 20 or what's going on in that regard? So that I've seen... A high degree of flexibility in that. And that's really to deliver what the investors are looking for. So most general partners are willing to be flexible in that regard. If it's a higher cash flowing deal, it probably lends itself better to having a preferred return for LP investors. And then if there is a preferred return, generally it'd be a 70-30 split because if you think about it, that preferred return is compensation to the LPs. So it makes sense that the GPs would get a little bit heavier of a heavier of a split um, beneath that on the waterfall. If it's a lower cash flowing deal, more equity based, where the LPs would be primarily paid out through a refinance or a sale event, that's where probably the 80-20 split would make more sense. So that when that capital event does occur, the LPs are compensated for their their time value of money essentially mm-hmm. in a higher fashion. Well, you've been in this business a long time. And when we're talking to the debt lenders, as opposed to the equity uh, partners, 
Those are different conversations. What is it that the equity partners want to hear as opposed to what the debt partners want to hear? Wow, that's a great question. And I could talk about that one for probably an hour. So I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible here. The debt partners are are more risk averse, which you know makes sense, right? They're the largest check writers and they're doing this at massive scale uh, for the most part. So they're they're tough to go outside their their comfort zone or their standard boundaries. So they have pretty rigorous metrics that they're going to look at as far as first and foremost being debt service coverage ratio. So that's the amount of net income divided by the, the uh, monthly or annual debt service payment. And what that, that number should be greater than one, usually it should be greater than uh, about 1.2. And what that, that 0.2 is essentially is a, is a buffer or a cushion against the property to ensure that if income does go down for whatever reason, maybe there's renovations occurring. Uh, so there's a little bit of vacancy. Maybe there's economic vacancy because there's a pandemic and, and the renters aren't paying, aren't paying the rent on time and you're getting some delinquency there. You uh, really want to have that cushion to ensure that you're able to still hit that debt service payment. So I'd say that's a, a primary factor for the, the lenders. They have some other factors that are metrics that kind of tie into that, but uh, it's, all, it's all income and expense based and relatively straightforward. On the equity side, um, it's going to be a little bit more nuanced or customized to that individual equity provider, more so than you know, three to five year IRR. That's kind of been the main driver up to this point. People looking for 18, 20 plus percent IRR. That's actually shifted a little bit over the last couple of months as we've seen the, the markets change here. Now you're going to see really longer term vision, but it's more on a year to year basis. So sponsors really need to be dialed in as far as what their business plan looks like on a year to year, if not month to month basis. So some things that equity providers are going to look for is ability to have that capital event. If you're really factoring in a refinance to, to, ca- to pay out, cash out investors and return capital, essentially, uh, that's a big factor, especially for a preferred equity group. They generally want to be shorter term holders. Um, so even if you're projecting a five-year hold, preferred equity group might want to be cashed out within two to three years and not stay along for the full ride. So you really need to have your debt service coverage and your your rental increases essentially or your NOI increases mapped out year to year to where mm-hmm. you are achieving enough uh, value add and force appreciation to where you're able to refinance to a substantial enough amount to pay off that preferred equity provider that might be writing five, 10, $15 million check. And that's a pretty substantial capital event that you need to be able to achieve. So being able to customize your, your underwriting to really provide a high level confidence that you'll be able to hit that uh, in year two or three when you're fully stabilized and that value has been realized. Or that two to three year timeline, that would be really scary for me because market conditions, well, they can shift quite dramatically in a very short period of time. And that doesn't give you a two to three year period. This doesn't give the GPs a whole lot of flexibility. That seems like a very risky endeavor. How with these short-term preferred equity lenders, how firm, how, uh, how is that written in stone? It's two to three year term or are there ways to renegotiate that? Yeah, that's a great observation and good question. It really is customizable by each group. I, we know two groups are, are exactly the same. Some are much more stringent on that. Some will build in contingencies or backup plans, or they're amenable to having your uh, sponsorship legal team negotiate those in. So uh, yet another reason to have a, a really strong uh, syndication uh, legal counsel on your side to, to negotiate strong contracts in your favor. One kind of hot topic uh, that's even started before um, interest rates started increasing, I'd say a year, maybe two years ago, is increasing liquidity in these uh, syndicated sponsorship deals for limited partners. So I think that's becoming more of a, a national focus, focal area to be able to do things like uh, cash out a preferred equity investor in year two with common equity, perhaps, or another equity option, and to be able to have that high degree of confidence that that, that money will mm-hmm. show up at the end of year two, recapitalize the deal, essentially, and then continue the hold period as uh, the property continue to appreciate into year five or, or uh, perhaps mm-hmm. even beyond. So you're seeing that through a couple of different forms, uh, uh, different funds of common equity are pretty common where the money is kind of pre-raised or pre-reserved and able to be deployed quickly. Uh, I'm sure you're hearing a lot about tokenization. So that's uh, really intended to offer liquidity and secondary trading 
to uh, limited partnership interests. So, uh, you know, that's always been kind of the one da- downside or perceived downside of commercial real estate investment is the lack of liquidity and that you're kind of committed for multiple years. So I think that's something the market is really demanding. And there's a lot of innovative players out there that are trying to deliver solutions in that regard. Well, Keith, tell our viewers and listeners what you have to offer and how they can get in touch with you to take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. So as I mentioned, I'm one of the founding four members of Symphony Capital Group. We're a multifamily syndication Mm -hmm. investment firm based in San Diego. We have apartment uh, syndications across the Southwest, primarily focused on Texas markets right now, specifically Dallas, Fort Worth. So right now we have about 750 doors, assets under management. Uh, We're under contract right now on a 200 unit, uh, really high quality asset in uh, one of the best submarkets of Dallas. Um, So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go to symphonycapitalgroup.com forward slash invest, sign up for our investor list, and you'll get uh, emails about specific deals. You'll get a lot of good educational content, um, webinars we put on. We really work hard to educate our LP investors on on, uh, passive investing, commercial real estate investing in general. We try to do at least one webinar a month, if not more than that. And then one of my co-principals, Ellis Hammond, hosts a uh, really, really strong podcast called The Future of Real Estate. You can find on any of the major podcast platforms. He's had some awesome guests on there. uh, And that's kind of focusing on where the industry is headed. So I'm really proud to be part of a team that considers itself pretty innovative and and technology centric and and system centric and trying to uh, stay on the forefront of this industry and and really streamlined on the way that we we operate in an efficient manner. So all those are are really good resources to start. Uh, Keith, you suggest that those just uh, starting out from an active investor perspective, join in as a junior partner with those who've had more experience. Do you offer opportunities like that for junior partners and how do they go about becoming a junior partner? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Glad, glad you mentioned that. So the uh, easiest way is really to, re- to reach out to me. I'm Keith at symphonycapitalgroup.com is my email. All those relationships are you know, pretty, pretty tailored to the specific situation, but we have a lot of experience in doing those. So we have a pretty streamlined method of kind of vetting the feasibility up front so that we're not uh, burning a lot of time on, on either side for something that might not be feasible or something that might make more sense six months down the road versus... Uh, present day, but we're always happy to entertain those. Um, I'd say right now, specifically, as I mentioned, we're really focused on the Texas markets and Dallas-Fort Worth in particular. So if you have any uh, any major deal deal sources or capital sources in those markets, definitely reach out to me, uh, Keith at symphonycapitalgroup.com, and we can uh, get a conversation going. So in other words, find the property and then come to you. Is that what you're saying? Find the property or find find the uh, equity and and come to us. On either side of the table, we'd be So building a team is a very critical uh, component of sustaining business success. So you have a core team that you have been with, what, for 20, 25 years or so, but you do have these opportunities for junior partners. And you did mention that you do a lot of vetting uh, in terms of bringing on junior partners Take us through that vetting process. Well, a lot of it is is time frame based. So uh, we we've been so constricted on the time to to close a deal. When you think about your due diligence and your closing time frame, and that's been super super competitive over the last couple of years. Uh, with the caveat that things are a little bit different now, so that might be changing in the other direction. But we're, that's still kind of yet to be seen. But in in the recent times of needing to offer a closing within 45 to 60 days, you really need to hit the ground running and you don't have a lot of time to build new relations, completely new relationships on general partners, co-sponsors in terms of what their operational responsibilities are going to be, what their acquisitions or due diligence responsibilities will be, uh, what their equity sources might be. So that needs to be pretty well mapped out, I'd say right from the start. And that's something that your senior lenders are going to start asking you for almost from day one. So um, you need to have that pretty well buttoned up. So again, I, I like to get those conversations started before we go under contract on a deal, maybe even before LOI or letter of intent is is submitted because things happen really quickly once an offer is on the verge of getting accepted. Mm-hmm. Well, you say that there uh, is no substitute for managing your own rental properties, which is kind of contrary to what a lot of people say. They say, don't manage your own properties. Why do you say there's no substitute for managing your own property? I would say do it for a short period of time and have your exit plan 
uh, mapped out before you even get started, or at, le- at least uh, uh, conceived of uh, before you get started. But uh, you will you will learn what the pain points of of the process. You will learn how the different components integrate as far as successful property and asset management. And that really is critical when you want to ultimately become more of a portfolio manager of, of assets, mm-hmm. a higher level asset manager. And again, we're all working to scale up our, our holdings and our portfolios. So if you want to be able to have the bandwidth to do that, you really need effective skills in managing other people and managing other resources. And there's, in my opinion, no substitute for understanding what those resources are going through and then doing it yourself for, for a relatively short period of time. So, um, you know, obviously I'd recommend doing that on a smaller uh, multi-unit if, if possible, or, or maybe sharing the responsibility of the burden if you are doing 100 units plus, so then you're not completely overwhelmed, but it's worth doing at least for a couple of months to really get your hands on there and, and understand once you do bring in another uh, resource to take on responsibilities, uh, what they're going through and how to manage them effectively. Yeah, there's really no teacher uh, like experience and active learning is certainly the best way to learn. I have one question, though, about that. Any investment is a risk, but if you're not experienced as a property manager and then you're going in there on a new acquisition and you're learning on the job, there's a lot of opportunity for screw ups there that could be have a big impact upon the outcome of that uh, particular investment. While learning, how do you mitigate for all of that risk? Great question. So really property management, again, depending on the size of the property, has a couple different roles involved. Um, And I wouldn't recommend doing them all yourself unless it's a pretty small property. So you're going to need the day-to-day on-site team. Um, And they're going to be doing tenant interaction, lease renewals, uh, prospective tenant showings, Things like that, a lot of a lot of the paperwork, um, a lot of the uh, day-to-day vendor, um, I'd say, uh, hands-on management of actually escorting vendors, getting them access to the the infrastructure that, that they need within the property. Uh, that's something that is probably best suited to, to to farm out to an extent. So uh, you can oftentimes will retain the existing property manager if possible for a, a short period of time uh, to help uh, with that transition until a permanent team can be put in place. But yeah, you want to be more focused on asset management than day-to-day property management in that role. So that would be things like reviewing the P&L, profit and loss statements, doing contractor vetting, making sure that your your pricing with contractors is reasonable, getting multiple bids, uh, that that type of thing that's a little bit more bottom line line focused than day-to-day tenant interaction focused. I can see that that would be good too, but learning that day-to-day stuff is a skill in and of itself too. Uh, so it could be very And there's valuable. really uh, impressive, low-cost property management software these days. So uh, you know, if you're managing a 10-unit, 20-unit, and you think that you can kind of handle that uh, yourself, you can, you can get a $50 a month uh, software platform that will do electronic lease signing and uh, pretty much all of your accounting for you, uh, do invoicing, yeah, contract signing, um, pretty much the entire gamut. So that's something that we didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. So it has become a lot more efficient in that regard in terms of some of the systems that are out there that are uh, relatively low cost. Yeah, for sure. Well, just even in the last five years, there's been a huge shift in, in multifamily technologies, which there needed to be. I mean, it is, uh, it is process intensive. Uh, so they've been very helpful there. Enlightened investors, thank you once again for being with us today. What a pleasure having shared this time with Keith. And Keith, thanks for sharing your many years of experience with us. Enlightened investors, until we meet next time, live abundantly. Keith, thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, Alan. It was great speaking with you. Thank you for tuning in to Real Estate Investing Abundance, brought to you by Steve Talker Capital a company working for passionate professionals like you to develop financial independence built on solid, passive real estate investments. As part of our efforts to make the world a better place, Steve Talker Capital contributes to activities and organizations committed to better understand the equine. These endeavors attempt to enhance the human treatment of horses worldwide. Steve Talker Capital, working for a world where all creatures, great and small, flourish abundantly. For resources to develop your financial independence, connect with us at stevetalker.com.